My name is Rose Chiachi and I'm the Executive Director of the Pike County Public Library. I'm here to today to tell you how to sign up for a library card. If you're a Pike County resident, it's really easy. You just stop by with proof of residency and a photo ID and we'll get you all signed up. If you're not a resident, it's also really easy. You can just stop by with a photo ID and for $35, you'll have full access to all of the library resources. Unfortunately, right now our buildings aren't open to the public, but you can still sign up for a library card on our website, www.pcpl.org. Whether you're doing research for a project or looking for some inspiration, we can absolutely help you find what you're looking for. A really cool thing about libraries is that if we don't have the item that you're looking for, we can find it for you, no problem. We have a huge network of libraries in Pennsylvania and the entire country that we can borrow from on your behalf. Please check out our website, www.pcpl.org, for all of the virtual opportunities we're offering right now, or give us a call with any questions. Finally, I want to thank everyone from Peters Valley for bringing these great programs to our community and including the library. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Good evening. I'm Kristen Muller, Director of Peters Valley, welcoming you tonight to our programming made possible through a gift from the Richard L. Snyder and the Greater Pike County Community Foundation that is sponsoring these artist lectures for us in partnership with the Pike County Library. Um, if you haven't been to Peters Valley, we're in Layton, New Jersey, just 20 minutes from Milford, PA. And um, tonight, I'm very, very excited to um, introduce two dear friends of mine, Lisa G. Westheimer and Bill Westheimer. And um, tonight, we're, they're going to present about their work and a couple of housekeeping things. This recording will be made available through our YouTube channel in a couple of days if you missed it. Um, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A down on the right. If you don't know Zoom, if you just scroll your cursor down to the right, there's a little section that says Q&A and you can place your questions for Bill and Lisa, which they'll answer once the um, talk is finished. So let me tell you a little bit about my friends. Lisa G. Westheimer is an artist living and working in West Orange, New Jersey. She received her BA from New York University in 1983 and a Master's of Arts in Studio Arts Ceramics from Montclair State University in 2008. From 1983 to 2006, she co-owned the New York City Building Code consulting firm, the Manhattan Expedition Inc., specializing in loft conversions for artists, temporary structures for performances, high-end residential and commercial spaces in Manhattan. Some of her clients included the residences and studios of Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, Kiki Smith, April Gornick, and Eric Fischel, Jeff Koons, Joel Shapiro, Shapiro, Julian Schnabel, and the artist who changed her life, Bill Westheimer. She studied luster firing techniques at the Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts in California and has taken many workshops at Peters Valley School of Craft, which leads her on a determined journey of pushing the boundaries of media of ceramics and fusible glass. Lisa has also served as artist in residence at Our Lady of Lords Church in West Orange, New Jersey, and a volunteer artifact conservator and taxidermy cleaner at the Thomas Edison National Historic Park in West Orange. I'd have to see that to believe it. Her work has been shown nationally and she teaches at Peters Valley School of Craft and Montclair Art Museum's Yard School of Art. She's taught alternative firing workshops for the Covenant of Sacred Heart School in New York and privately. Lisa is author of Glass Fusing and Clay Kiln and the instructional videos, Horsehair Barbecue and Luster Firing with Lisa G. Westheimer. Welcome Lisa. Now for Bill. A born experimenter, Bill was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio and began playing with photographic processes in high school. He was introduced to the magic of the darkroom in the mid 1960s and has never looked back. Beginning with a darkroom and the third floor bathroom, Bill mastered developing and printing black and white photographs in his teens, experimented with making 3D holograms before he could drive. Bill also explored high contrast image making solarization and other alternative processes in those early years. While still in high school, Bill and three partners operated a light show business that accompanied nationally known rock and roll bands. Their Flavor Scope Light Show Company became the house light show at Cincinnati's premier concert hall, 
the Ludlow Garage and worked with bands such as the Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, B.B. King, the MC5, Vanilla Fudge, Bitter Blood Sweet Theater, and many other marquee name brands of the era. The light show tapped into Bill's love of alternative processes and experimental image making. He created abstract slideshows, hand-drawn 16 millimeter film loops and other experimental background lighting image making techniques. Wow. Now at Union College, Bill studied philosophy and art. He studied with noted painter and educated educator Arnold Biddleman. He also studied scientific photography techniques while at Union, and he continued his experiments in photography while completing college. Later, Bill studied with Jerry Birchfield, who introduced him to color photograms and cybochrome, now ilfochrome printing. I bet we're going to learn about that tonight a little bit, right? Um, Bill went on to teach cybochrome printing at Colorado Mountain College in Aspen. He was a volunteer and member of the board of directors of Mountain Rescue Aspen during the 10 years he lived there. Early in this millennium, he learned the 19th century technique of collodion glass plate photography from leading experts in the field, Franz Scully and Mark Osterman. Recent works include modern fossils of photograms printed on slate, 3D printed book sculpture, photograms made on collodion glass plates, Ilfochrome and gelatin silver media. He collaborated on a camera obscura project with Charles Schwartz documenting the city of New York and published the book Manual, The Personality of Hands. He collaborated with Leonard Seastone of Title Line Press to create limited edition artist books of salted paper prints with an ambrotype photogram bound in the cover. His Gutenberg series is a series of 3D printed artist books his works are exhibited in galleries in museums worldwide. Now to wrap it all up, married for 30 years, Bill and Lisa live and work in a converted historic stable in the historic first planned residential community in the United States, Llewellyn Park, located in West Orange, New Jersey, Glenmont, once home to Thomas and Mita Edison, now part of the National Park Service. It's just down the street and a great source of inspiration for them. So, wow, we can't wait to see what you have for us tonight. Remember everyone, you can put your questions in the Q&A. Welcome, Bill and Lisa. And I think we're gonna, who's going first, Lisa? Lisa, but I- I'm to, gonna go first. I have to say, I, I'm not gonna give my talk because you already said it all. Did I? <laughs> Lucky you. Oh, <laughs> no. No. You have to show us now. Right. Yes. Right? Okay, let's go, Bill. Share the screen. Okay. Come on. Let's do this. Thanks, Kristen. I want to give a huge shout out to Peters Valley School of Craft and also to the Pike County Lib Public Library. I have four library cards and I, it sounds like I'm about to get a fifth and I use them weekly to download ebooks and audiobooks. So without further ado, so go ahead and get your library card. <laughs> Bill and I have been married for 30 years and we're each other's muses. I looked up the definition and it says a source of inspiration, especially a guiding genius. Now, we are sources of inspiration for each other and we do guide each other on our artistic journeys, especially when we kind of veer off, which often happens. But no, we're not geniuses. We want to get that out there right now. Okay. So Bill and I met, hang on one second. Bill and I met in the mid 1980s when Bill was a commercial photographer living and working in Soho. And I, when I saw his images, I was just struck by their beauty, their, their color, their composition, the movement in them the lighthearted playfulness of them. And I just couldn't believe that these were photographs. And Bill said, no, no, they're photograms. I made them without a camera. It's a cameraless process done in a dark room. And I was like, wow, this guy is pushing the boundary of photography in a way I've never seen it before. And um, after, let's see, after we got married, 
Bill knew that I had originally gone to college to study ceramics. I went to Sarah Lawrence College to study ceramics with Michael Zakin. And uh, life got in the way, as it often does, and I had to leave um, the art pursuit. And I transferred to NYU, got a full-time job to support myself through school, and just left um, studying fine art behind. And Bill challenged me. He said, uh, when are you going to get back into ceramics? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe when I retire. He's like, no, 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 no. You might never retire. We're going to do this. And he converted his old uh, dark room into a little ceramic studio for me and put a kiln in his uh, photography studio. He saw the artist in me way before I saw her in myself. So shortly after that, we moved to where we are now in West Orange, New Jersey, and we built studios for ourselves side by side from each other separated by a door. Shortly thereafter, I had the great fortune to meet William McCreet, who was head of ceramics at Montclair State University, who also saw the artist in me way before I saw her in myself, and he encouraged me to enroll in the master's program. So I worked during the day and I went to school at night for four years and I decided I was gonna do a Bill Westheimer. I was going to push every single boundary that I could in my medium. So I took one of Bill's uh, glass collodion plates and I melted it in the kiln just to see what would happen. Like him, I started taking found objects and putting them, um, he would put his on light sensitive paper, I put mine between two pieces of glass. This is a coral sea fan, um, just to see what would happen. Then I asked him to make me specific amber types so that I could work them into my ceramic sculptures. And then I was throwing glass on red hot glazed pieces that were in the Raku kiln just to see what would happen. After graduation, uh, by the way, um, graduating, I, I got my diploma at four, when I was 46. It was the second happiest day in my life. The first happiest was when I married this guy. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, um, all that that I learned over those four years, I took into my work um, post-graduation. This is a series called Ex Voto. It's ongoing. Um, I'm really pushing every single boundary I can in making them. These are um, closed forms that contain heart-shaped tokens with text on them that are specific in theme to the container that they're in. Now, making them was hard enough. Firing them, some of them are pit fired, some are raku, some are luster where I threw mothballs and pine sticks in my electric kiln. These processes alone had a very high failure rate, but I kept going. And then to make it even more difficult, I wanted to have fused glass windows that were in the same shape of the um, pieces that they were gonna fit into. And then let's add that I wanted the hearts to float or look like they were floating above a custom mixed LED lighting system. So Bill 3D printed frameworks for me to um, attach these um, tokens to that straddle the lighting system. And the lighting system is still a disappointment. I'm still researching uh, good ones. The ones that give me the colors I want have to be spliced together and put together by Bill and have to be serviced a lot. And the ones that are wireless, like in here, there's only like five colors and the, the, they fail a lot. So that's an ongoing process. Um, I started experimenting and taking some of Bill's images that I really liked and having them scanned into glass decals that I then fired onto glass and then fired a piece of iridescent glass on top to make it shimmer and give it some dimension. These are some mountain ranges. Uh, Bill did aerial photography as part of Mountain Rescue in the 1970s. This is a dragonfly that I dragged home. I found it in the street dead and I brought it home and I'm like, here, Bill, put this on, use this in your photography. 
And these are some ferns and a cricket that D Bill um, did as part of that book that Kristen had uh, mentioned in the introduction. More on these later. Then the pandemic hit. Bill and I had um, spent the winter in Colorado and we returned to our New Jersey home where our studios are on March 6th. And by March 13th, everything shut down. We were in an epicenter and um, two of our friends had died um, very quickly. They got sick and then two weeks later they were dead. A lot of people we knew uh, who lived nearby were sick, entire families. So Bill and I decided that we were gonna take this super seriously. So we just um, shut ourselves off in our, on our property only to leave to get groceries. And we lived this very monastic life during this time. I would get up in the morning and I would pray and I would tend to our animals and I'd grow vegetables. And Bill would, would um, do yoga and bake bread. And here he is, this is like a mashup of the check the pizza pose between baking and yoga. And here he is wearing his monk's hood while worshiping at the altar of Amazon Prime. Um, uh, you know, here was every artist's dream of having endless amounts of time, no commitments and fully stocked studios. So it's like, what do I do? I fall into this rabbit hole where I call it my Francis Bacon period. I just paced around my studio like this caged wild animal. I had no creativity. I was just like this bundle of emotion. And um, then I came to the point where I realized that my art making is the intersection of spirit and science. And spirit obviously left the building. So I was just gonna throw myself into the science. So I did glaze formulations, I did chemistry, I did math, I did percentages, shrinkage rates, I created clays, I tested everything. And gradually the um, creativity returned. And the first series that I wanted to work on during the pandemic was something that I had hidden on a shelf in my studio for years. And it was um, to make reliquary boxes for all of the, uh, my deceased pets that I've had since even before knowing Bill. Now, mind you, we don't have children, we have pets and you tend to outlive your pets. And I was in the state of mourning anyway. I was mourning my friends. I was mourning the shutdown. I was, I, you know, so I figured this is the perfect time to address this. And at the same time, I wanted to challenge myself to learn new things to take into future work. I wanted to um, use this series to explore the graphic novel style of working. So what I did was I made these cartoonish glass painted images of my pets. And then I challenged myself by working their, uh, some of their ashes into the clay for each of their boxes. And the challenge was that I had to use up all the clay for the one box for that one animal. I couldn't um, transfer it over to another um, uh, another box. And also I had to learn shrinkage rates to make sure that the clay after it was fired would be um, the right size to fit these windows. Another thing I challenged myself with was that something went wrong like warpage or something. I had to cold work it. I couldn't start over. So I put their effects in each of their boxes. Many of these are Raku fired using the fur of the animal in the combustion. Um, this was the only one that I had an issue. And of course it's because my cat Mooch, he was an issue. He always dissed us somehow. His lid warped, but I had to uh, work around that. And Bill 3D printed an open box trough for this paw print that the crematorium made for Petey's paw so that I could create a lid with a glass um, um, top to it. Now, um, another prevailing feeling I had during the pandemic was the sense of nostalgia for place. Um, Bill and I have four places that we consider home. 
One of them is here in West Orange. Another is Conifer, Colorado, where we spend our winter. Um, Cape Cod, Truro, Massachusetts, and New York City. So I decided I was going to venerate um, imagery of these places um, as if when I close my eyes, what I see when I think of them. Because let's face it, if I got COVID and died, I wouldn't be able to go to these places anymore. So back to these um, uh, images that I had made on glass. I had the presence of mind to bring soil back from conifer. So I created clays containing the soils of each of these places. So this is what I call a Colorado fantasy range. I combine these three images into one um, mount, fantasy mountain range consisting of the Maroon Bells, Capitol Peak, and Snowmass Peak. And the frame has conifer Colorado soil in it. This is the front and this is the back. Um, these next two pieces are not finished yet because this guy over here has to make stands for me, right? Bill, you're going to make stands, right? Yeah. Right, good. Okay. You behave yourself. Okay, so anyway, um, this is the dragonfly. Now, my memories of um, where we live here, our property is called Woodlands Meadow Stables. We have a big uh, meadow in front of our house, and in the summertime, squadrons of dragonflies hover like helicopters over the grass, and it's really quite something. And um, once again, this contains soil from Llewellyn Park. And another thing is we have this bed of giant ostrich ferns that are three feet tall, and in the summertime, they sway and rustle in the breeze, and you can hear the crickets singing in them. So what I learned in the previous two series brought me to these two sculptures in the Rage series. I was in a tremendous state of rage, um, and I was going to make two sculptures to address that. One um, is called COVID Nation, and it addresses the, how the healthcare professionals throughout the country were totally overwhelmed and unsupported during the pandemic especially during the first wave. So what I did was, oh, by the way, in the chats, there will be a link specifically to this piece and the next one so that you can see all of my research and what's written on, on and in both of these sculptures. And in this case, um, you'll be able to read the stories of these medical professionals who um, worked throughout the country during the first wave who put their lives on the line um, to just take care of people who were dying at this alarming rate and dying without their families. So these people were like their surrogates and their stand-ins as these people died. And they had to uh, sequester themselves from their families so as not to um, be contagious. And I think that's an awful lot to ask of a person. So I created this box to memorialize and thank them. And contained inside the box are heart-shaped ex-voto tokens with their names, their locations, and their professions written on them. And each one represents a personal prayer of thanksgiving from me for their service. Here's a video of the piece. And like I said, you can read all of the text that's written all over it and inside it. Um, on my website. So the COVID temporary field tents is in honor of a friend of mine who worked at Mount Sinai who was in charge of putting um, ICU tents up in Central Park. And inside has statistics of um, how many people had died and tested positive and negative on July 1st of 2020. And that date is the date that Donald Trump said that it might be patriotic if somebody wore a mask. It was the first time he, he endorsed wearing a mask. Um, so that addressed that issue. And here's the piece finished. Finally, this one is called 6120, A Sorrowful Mystery. This one was the big kahuna for me because I made so many of these glass uh, paintings that the, the piece had to be really big.
the lid was really heavy and it was always under threat of collapse as i was making it it addresses two dates in our american history may twenty fifth of twenty twenty when george floyd was killed and when amy cooper called the cops on a black bird watcher when he asked her to leash her dog in central park that spawned the black lives matter movement and the protests that were happening across the country um on six one twenty uh june first of twenty twenty donald trump ordered um washington dc protesters fired upon with tear gas and rubber bullets so that he could clear a walk to a church he doesn't go to stand in front of it and hold up a bible he doesn't read something snapped in me that day the firewall to my rage oozed out and i needed to make the sculpture to just put the lid on it so it took me two weeks just to glaze it i had 12 different glazes three coats each i had to put it on with a tiny little brush and if it wasn't for this guy every single day coming in the studio checking on me showing me his work if i didn't hear i found it so comforting to hear him working on the other side of the wall knocking around in his dark room running the water ha listening to his 3d printer running and i knew th you know he would come in and bring me something to drink and i knew that things were bad when he brought me a stick and he said look at this pretty stick i found just for you and i was like oh god <laughs> but anyway i persevered the piece worked out i loosely based it architecturally upon the building in front of which donald trump stood it had a mansard roof with slate so i instead of making slate tiles i made ex voto tokens bearing the names of people of color who in my research were killed unjustly by law enforcement and um like i said you can go to my website and see and read everything that's written inside and out of this piece and you can see the research that i did about the lives of these people There was a bright spot in the darkness. Um, about a year and a half ago, I finished this piece. It's called Our Lady of Lords Pray For Us. And Bill Well did the stand for me. And I had the distinct honor of giving it to Cardinal Tobin. Now, for those of you who don't know what a cardinal is in the Catholic Church, they're one rung below the Pope. And when we need one, they elect the Popes. So anyway, I thought that I was going to, um, that my piece was going to be given to some minion in a box uh, and, and it was going to go in his closet and you'd never see it. But in walks this man wearing a puffball jacket with um, the logo of his gym on the jacket. And he's like, I'm Cardinal Tobin, what's in the box? And I said, oh, it's a present for you. And he's like, oh, I have to see it, open it up. And he actually talked to me for 30 minutes about the piece. He couldn't wait to show it to his 97 year old mother because she prays to Our Lady of Lords um, every day. And just last Sunday, he came to our church to say mass. I'm not exactly sure why. And I was in the audience in the pews. And just before the final blessing, he said, I have two pieces of art in my office that I look at every day. One is a statue of Pope Francis that a friend of mine made, and the other is a statue of Our Lady of Lourdes made by Lisa Westheimer. And I just lost it. I just burst out crying I, because I felt like it, it just happened. You know, as a sacred artist in the Catholic tradition, we spend most of our time um, defending our work rather than having people enjoy it. And I just feel like if I never touched a, a piece of clay again, it's okay, you know? And if it, um, if it wasn't for this guy here, this one right here, who makes my stands, who 3D prints for me, who brings me sticks he finds in the woods, who opens the lid when I'm raccoon and just does, takes gorgeous photographs of my work. If it wasn't for him seeing the artist in me before I did, I never would have gotten to this point. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Take it away, Bill.
Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know if I can follow up, follow that act, but I'll try. Good evening, everyone. Thanks to Peters Valley. Thanks to the Pike County Library and the Pike Greater Pike Community Foundation for giving us this opportunity to embarrass ourselves. Um, I guess I'm her muse. Uh, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. I'm not sh likely, so I'm not at all sure about that dictionary definition with the word genius in it. <laughs> um, anyway, I've been making art for a long time, and Kristen filled you in on all of it, so it's sort of a, a recap with a few visuals to go with it. Um, I started when I was in my early teens, and I've been lucky to have had a lot of wonderful mentors and, and muses, a few muses. But 30 years ago, I got really lucky and I found my own in-house muse. She's right there. When we got married, Lisa said, um, I may not always make you happy, but you'll never be bored. And that pretty much describes what living together and making art side by side is like. Muse might not tell me what I want to hear, but honesty is better than flattery any day. And I really appreciate that Lisa has my back. If I had to name one th theme. Isn't he a cute kid? If I had to name one theme of my creative life, it's a love of experimentation. I like to get a good handle on a process and then start experimenting and playing around to discover how to make that process my own. I grew up in the psychedelic 1960s, rejecting the conventional. So I'm willing to push the envelope and try crazy stuff in my art. Challenging the norm comes to me honestly. It drives Lisa crazy and not always in the good way. The list of experiences that inform my art is long and I won't make you listen to all that but a few do warrant mentioning. I was part of the light show that Kristen mentioned that performed with some of the biggest rock bands of the 60s. The first time we performed with the Grateful Dead, I wasn't even old enough to drive. We worked with Santana and the Allman Brothers among many others. And that experience gave me lots of opportunities to experiment and grow. If you fast forward a whole lot of years, after college, I took a workshop with the late California experimental artist, Jerry Birchfield, and he impressed on me that it, just experimenting is being creative. Jerry's curiosity and imagination were boundless, and from him I learned how to make photograms. This is one of Jerry's photograms. A photogram is a photo made without a camera. It's one of the first techniques of photography. To make a photogram, you place an object on a sensitized material, then expose it and develop it. It's sort of like an x-ray, but using visible light instead of x-rays. This photogram was done by Anna Atkins in the 1840s. She was one of the pioneers of photography. In the 1920s, the surrealists like Man Ray experimented with photograms for amazing images like this one that Man Ray did. In 1984, I moved to New York City to be a photo assistant. I learned about the commercial photography world and I made art at the same time. I assisted a photographer traveling on location for two weeks at a time. I was carrying his bags and loading his cameras. And then I would have two weeks off in New York City to uh, recover, but I took those two weeks to make my own work and visit galleries and museums. After a few years of assisting, I struck out on my own, looking for freelance work, making photograms for commercial clients. This is a picture I did for the New York Times. I was lucky to be able to make, take my experimental photogram techniques that I used to make art and transform them into commercial work. I made multi-layered photograms for book covers, annual reports, editorial illustration, 
and advertise them. This was a magazine spread. There were very few people doing the kind of experimental work I offered. One thing was fundamental for me. My art, and this is a fine art piece from my Waterflower series, my art helped make my commercial work better, and the commercial work helped make my art better. And this was a piece I did for Travel and Leisure magazine. And all this work was analog. There was no Photoshop at the time. If you wanted a multi-layered picture, it was done in the pre-press, and the printing company was going to do it for you. So I was lucky to have these, this technique that no one else was doing. I love working with art directors who pushed me to try new things and improve my images. This was an illustration for an article to set children's mind at ease that they wouldn't be cloned. Often I would produce work that I felt was a failure and the art director would help me to recognize that it actually succeeded. That intoxicated me. This was a book cover I did. Plus, I was fortunate to live in a small loft building with other artists, and we could help each other with our work and our ideas and inspirations. We were each other's muses. It was that loft building that brought Lisa into my life. She helped make us make, she helped us make our building legal in the eyes of the New York City Building Department. Later on in 1999, when Lisa and I moved to West Orange and built studios next to each other in this old stable, it was important to us to share our work and thoughts and inspiration. And in 2001, I got together with five other photographers to learn the 19th century wet plate collodion technique from the experts, Franz Scully and Mark Osterman. Franz is on the left in the front row and um, Mark was behind the camera in this picture. And Lisa was right there, you see her in the back next to me, uh, helping out, making suggestions and modeling. The wet plate technique was common in the late 1800s and involves coating a glass plate or piece of blackened metal with a collodion and sensitizing it with silver nitrate. It must be exposed and processed before the collodion dries, which is less than 15 minutes. Hands have always been a motif in my work. This was another magazine illustration. I found that in commercial illustration, a hand was a great way to represent people. I often used hands in my fine art photograms too. This is from the series titled Manipulation. And I was looking through some contact sheets recently. This is probably from the 1960s. I found this photographs of hands, which I probably made for the light show. One of Lisa's ideas sent me on a really important path. She inspired me to make photographs she inspired me to photograph hands as a way of making portraits. Our hands re reveal so much about us and the lives we've led. You can not palm reading so much, but you can look at them and tell what kind of a life that person has led. Of course, like everything I do, I had to make these hand portraits more complicated than just pictures of hands made with a collodion wet plate process. This guy was an arborist and his hands looked like trees. Every person also collaborated with me to make a photogram of their hand. And they provided a handwritten description of themselves, which is at the bottom. And I assembled it all digital, digitally. I got to spend at least an hour and a half with each person and show them how to do this technique and talk to them about their lives. In the end, I made 150 portraits of people ranging in age from two to 102. This was the 102 year old man who took the subway from his Upper West Side apartment down to the Soho studio. And it was an opportunity for artistic types to do things 
in their photogram too. One of the great things about the collodion process on the left, you see that swirl that was totally accidental, but boy, does it seem to work with the tattoos that the guy has on his hand. And this is a pair of twins. I made several hundred 19th century style salted prints, salted paper prints of the photographs too. These salt prints are contact printed from the original four and a quarter by five and a half inch glass plate negatives. The manual project has been exhibited around the US. This was in Richmond, Virginia. And this was, I think, in Orange, New Jersey. And this was Sussex County Community College out near Peters Valley. I produced a coffee table book of a selection of the portraits available on Amazon. Uh, I made three different artist books. Uh, this is a collaboration with Leonard C. Stone of Tideline Press. He did the binding and uh, two 3D printed artist books. And I'm going to talk more about the art 3D printed artist books later. So the manual project kept me off the street for over five years. I worked in my studio in New Jersey, in a studio in New York City, and I had an artist residency in a castle in Scotland to make portraits. My own personal muse was joined by a large cast of other muses in this crazy 11th century castle. Later on, my ascent project was a whole different perspective on hands. These are 3D printed life-size sculptures, which imagine the evolution of today's analog man to the future's digital man. Ascent is my way of showing how our increasingly digital lives change how we use our hands and how the evolution of the familiar hand of today's analog man becomes future's unrecognizable hand of digital man. I started with a life-size plaster cast of my hand created with the help of the Johnson Atelier at the Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton, New Jersey. I used that cast to create photograms of the hand at 10 degree intervals of rotation. I scanned those 36 black and white photograms and provided them to the wizards at the digital atelier, which is also at the grounds for sculpture, who created a 3D digital model. Because of the lack of detail in the photograms, the 3D model wasn't a perfect reproduction of the original plaster hand. It had evolved. I had that model 3D printed, which you see there, and went through the same photogramming process with the 3D printed model, scanned those 36 photograms and had another model created by the di digital atelier. This pr iterative process was done five times.
when i got my own three d printer and could control the output i redesigned the sculptures so that each one has an earlier model inside and you can see it in these four and you can also see how the hand became more architectural in the end i produced 180 14 by 11 black and white photograms that would be displayed as part of the ascent project the 19 3D printed models are intended to be viewed all together as an installation with the frame photograms in the background. I love learning new technologies and techniques. The Ascent project gave me a chance to learn simple 3D CAD modeling and 3D printing. I spent a great deal of pandemic time refining, redesigning, and reprinting those sculptures using what I've learned over the years. Another recurring theme in my work has been combining old and new technologies. The Ascent Project had both analog photograms and 3D modeling. Similarly, the manual project combined the 19th century wet plate process with 20th century black and white photograms and also with contemporary digital imaging. In another era bridging project, I collaborated with Charles Schwartz on the Camera Obscura project, in which we digitally photographed the live New York City views produced by the pre-photographic Camera Obscura device that looked out across Central Park from Charles's office. Lisa worked for Charles to get his Camera Obscura approved by the New York City Department of Buildings. Then she introduced us and we became great friends and collaborators. Without Lisa, that never would have happened. For the longest time, I always thought of myself as a photographer. Lisa called me a lot of other things that I won't tell you about. I made images and I presented prints on paper like this ex exhibit at Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. Nowadays, I marvel that most of my work is making sculptures and artist books. I made a few sculptures years ago, but I never followed through with them until recently. So those are probably from the 60s. My Gutenberg project ponders how books have changed from Gutenberg's day to today's electronic books, which may become inaccessible due to technological obsolescence. These are 3D printed book shaped sculptures and they contain information just as a book does, a printed book does. But my sculptures in the shape of a book are sealed so that the information is inaccessible. Some of the books like this mini edition of the complete works of William Shakespeare contain the contents of a specific book on a USB drive, but you can't access it. You would have to break the book to get to the book. Some books contain a digital camera and inside that camera is a memory card with photos and video of the 3D printing of that particular book. There are books like this one of my Camera Obscura collaboration. It contains digital photographic prints, which you can't see, and features a pinhole in the back, just as the early camera obscuras used a pinhole as their lens. And this one contains wood shavings to represent the dead trees that go into real printed books. The covers of the book have a design of a tree and the box is made of wood too. And this one is the most complicated one I've ever done. I made a 21st century edition of the revolutionary 19th century book named The Silver Sunbeam. The 1864 book was the first book of recipes for photographic processes. Before Silver Sunbeam, you had to learn photography from someone else who was already doing it. My 21st century edition contains a USB drive with a scan of the rare original edition sealed inside. The front cover of the book shaped sculpture 
is a 19th century style tin type photogram made with only lenses, light, and silver nitrate. The cover of the box for the book holds a similar glass, tape, glass plate amber type photogram. And when the book is in the box, you can see the book's tin type photogram cover through the box's glass plate photogram. The point is that books are at risk of becoming unreadable. Books are changing in ways that we never anticipated and there will be unforeseen consequences. Anthropocene is another recent sculpture project. It imagines how tens or hundreds of thousands of years from now, some future beings may discover evidence of today's Anthropocene era when man's behavior caused life to cease on earth. They might dig up my modern fossils, which are collodion wet plate photograms on slate that look like fossils of ferns, insects, coral shells, and other flora and fauna that are at risk of extinction. I learned a few new skills, including how to cut slate. And then each sculpture has a welded steel stand mounted in a rock and learning how to weld eighth inch steel rod without melting it has been one of the most difficult skills I've ever tried. I spent an awful lot of time studying at the University of YouTube, majoring in MIG and TIG welding, and Lisa heard lots of my agony about the effort, and most of it can't be repeated in public. I have a lot of respect now for skilled welders, and I'm not one of them. I like to share the skills that I've acquired to help Lisa in her creative endeavors. As you've seen, I made stands for a few of her sculptures and I need to get back in the workshop to make more. I made some 3D printed stuff for her sculptures and even a 3D printed potter's stamp to help her sign her pieces. Sometimes I even help her with her damn Mac computers or show her how to do things in Photoshop. But there are limits. I refuse to listen to her trashy murder mystery audiobooks. From the library. That's part of the challenge of having adjacent studios. She likes to listen to audiobooks while working, but I can't concentrate if someone is yammering away. I do like music, but Lisa isn't fond of my 1960s stuff like Jefferson Airplane or Country Joe and the Fish. Too trippy. As they say, good fences make good neighbors, and fortunately, our studios have a door between us. So after many years of marriage, my mother used to say to my father, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. Lisa and I have 30 years together and make sure that every day we spend some time apart, which makes the time together even more precious. Did you ever hear of the 1960s comedy group called Firesign Theater? They said, how can I miss you if you won't go away? Togetherness with Lisa is wonderful and it's enhanced with a little private time. When we got married, we got a lot of advice. Some of it was better than others. Getting marriage advice from an unmarried priest seems a bit questionable. <laughs> But he told us that a successful marriage requires a sense of the other, a sense of wonder, and a sense of humor. We try. So to see more projects and more about what we do, visit our websites and follow us on social media. Thanks for watching. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank for coming in. Thank you both. That was amazing. Um, you're even cooler now. Now you're like muse cool to the cube. Uh, there, there's um, a few things I wanted to say um, that read to you. So when you, Lisa, were presenting about Cardinal. Yes, Cardinal Tobin. Tobin. Um, Cindy Lung said, what an honor, congratulations. Oh, thank you, Cindy. And then Roger C. Tucker III said, Lisa, what ceramic artist that 
what ceramic artist that you admire has created works in response to a cause like a war or a civil rights, human rights issue? Oh, Kristen, you probably would know their names. The, the brothers that make the pieces that had, um, what about they, Roberto Lugo? From, well, Roberto Lugo, definitely. Oh my God, thank oh, you. Oh, the twins, Ke Kevin and Keith, Keith. yeah. Uh, what's their name, Prince or? Um, they're brothers and they're from Pitts, is they're Pittsburgh, 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 and they make the Kelly brothers. The what are they Kelly brothers? I think, I think so. Yeah, but Roberto Lugo, definitely. I'm so inspired by his work, and um, he has he addresses a lot of social issues in his um sculptures. And he's in Philadelphia, I believe, and everybody should Google him because his work is awesome. And Ron Nagel also, right? Um, I'm thinking, uh, okay. Did the Delft wear with all the guns in it. Right. All right, now, Bill, Roger oh, Tucker the no. third is asking you bill are nfts being considered by you as an evolution of your digital practice um i have i've thought about it but you know it's really hard to embrace something that i don't fully understand i don't see the value in it and uh you know if you want to distribute your stuff digitally that's wonderful and but uh trying to Con someone out of money, even if it's fake money like uh, Bitcoin, for it doesn't give you um, exclusive anything really. I don't understand it. There you go. Rosemary Iverson says, Thank you, fantastic. Oh, Rosemary, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Susan Hammond says, Thank you, Bill and Lisa. Wonderful presentation. Sorry we're late. <laughs> Oh, no problem. <laughs> Glenn Gilmore says, uh, he's a blacksmith in Montana. Hi, Glenn. Another wonderful hour. So inspiring. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and there's uh, links, people, if anybody wants to read more about the work um, in the chat. But we have a question. Uh, Patricia Dalman says, great. Joy, you guys. I think it means love you, but. <laughs> um, let me see three more messages. Yen Yu says, thank you much, enjoyed so much. And Amelia Panico says, thank you, Lisa and Bill. Alexander Theory says, fantastic. So glad to hear you all speak, miss you both. Miss you too, yeah. hope you're well. That's great. Uh, Judy Gould, wow, it was so great to hear about your work and your life together. Thanks, and Judy. Roger Tucker says, awesome work from both of you. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, so anybody um, go right ahead and put some questions or comments in the Q&A. Um, I just think it's so nice that you work with one another and are able to complement one another. Interesting to see how your different techniques and approaches really inspire each other. You're very fortunate to have that. It's pretty, yeah, we feel pretty, like pretty special and also that you're going so deep into your work. I mean, I think that's really admirable that you just go all in. Yeah. And but it's funny because um, Bill has a little workshop on the other side of the other side of my my studio. And whenever you're welding, I can hear like this sound whenever, I don't know what you're doing that makes a sound, but it's I it's almost as if he's Dr. Frankenstein making them the monster come alive. <laughs> like, what in the world is he doing now? <laughs> I have a, so much respect for people who work in metal. Oh my God. <laughs> but blacksmithing. And, uh, I have a woodworking too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to say that your, um, your series with the hand, the evolving hands, um, it, I, I want to say to everybody, come to Peter's Valley where, where you will use your fingers so you don't lose them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> you have to keep using them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> true. It's true. That's though. true. That's what our hands make us different from all the other species on the planet. 
um, many, many years ago, I was in, I'm, I'm going to say it was in the 90s, and Chris Daly, who's a, a professor and ceramic artist from Penn State University, was teaching a workshop, and he was, and this, I mean, it was the 90s, so early 90s, before we had, everybody had the internet and laptops and phones, and he said, you know, I'm afraid that someday our eyes are going to be really big. We're going to turn into an ocular centric society with these giant eyes and little thumbs because we're going to be pressing joysticks. And, and then they came out with toys that had really giant eyeballs. And I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so a couple of comments here. Um, Amelia Panico is saying, where did you learn to weld, Bill? Well, my brother-in-law is a metal sculptor out in Phoenix, and he sent me a welder. And then I went on YouTube, and I spent a lot of time looking at how to do things and how not to make mistakes. And then I went and made all the mistakes and uh, just practiced and practiced and practiced. And I have a lot left to learn, a heck of a lot left to learn. And I, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead, you know, on the subject of making mistakes, some of my best work are mistakes. They're mistakes from things that I set out to do. And just through trying to teach myself the process, I've come up with these gorgeous, unexpected things that now I take copious notes because if I make a mistake along the way and it comes out beautifully, I want to know how to do it again. That's great. I, I think that's something that um, people often underestimate the amount of experimenting and iteration to get to the finished work. I see in the groups on social media where people ask like, what would happen if I did this? What would happen if I did that? And I remember, think back to when I was at Montclair State and I would say those things to um, Professor McCreep and he'd go, I don't know, why don't you find out? So, mm -hmm. and I did, and that's, that's the part of the journey that I enjoy the most, I think. I have log books in my darkroom going back to the 80s. So when I would make a print for somebody or for myself, I would write down all the details, what the exposure was and developing and um, how it was exposed. And I don't know that I've looked back at it that much, but I think it was really important for me to, to keep those records so at least I knew I could look back if I had to. And I think I remember things better once I've written them down. So mm. I think that keeping a log is important. I do it with the 3D printing. I keep a log. Uh, well, I have a question about that. Cindy um, Lewing, who has done quite a bit of 3D printing, because Cindy, I watched your presentation at Ensika. It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> awesome. She's asking, can you share some of the difficulties of learning how to use the 3D printer? And have you tried the ceramic one? I have not tried the ceramic one. It's a very tempting thing, but then I'd be treading in her territory. <laughs> um, uh, I've learned a lot by failing. Um, you had a lot of failures today. Right? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> oh, come on. I, I, no, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember how I learned. I think just by sort of doing it and experimenting. And I think the, the CAD part of it is the hardest part, trying to decide, design something on a computer, thinking in three dimensions when I'm really used to be just a flat surface guy, 2D. So you're thinking 3D on 2D, right? Yeah. yeah. So that it's like constantly moving in, in that 2D to 3D to 3D to 2D. Yeah, I think it's a really tough transition conceptually. And then on the computer itself, um, how do you use this device to dis that displays it in 2D to actually look at it in, in terms of three dimensions? And another thing, just noticing, like, because you got the new 3D printer um, during the pandemic, he just keeps at it. He doesn't stop. It just runs like 24 seven. And when Bill is in testing mode, he's prolific. He, you know, he doesn't step away from the work that's he's all in. And I think that um, is part of his getting the hang of it and this, the mastery of it is just 
keep doing it and making mistakes and remembering what you did net last and you know having a plan a lot of the pieces that i do um have to be printed multiple times because mm -hmm. they fail either the printer has a malfunction or there's a design error and i have to go back and redesign it and correct that error and then i'll put it again um, so it's not like it's sort of plug and play you I find that I've got to really work at it and I throw away a lot of work. Yeah, I think that that the people that are making good work do that. I think it's just people think that it's you're making a masterpiece after masterpiece, but that's not the way it works, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I remember seeing your Gutenberg series or you were speaking about it when you did the exhibition at Sussex County Community College. I think you had a, just a couple of the books, like the the flash drives in the mm -hmm. in the books and that blew my mind it really did it was like oh my gosh just the idea that all this data that's been like large files that have been compressed to these tiny little spaces that then will be rendered unreadable and we were still dealing with cds back then right and right. now everything's sort of moving to the cloud like it's already happening in just a matter of a few years mm -hmm. um I actually have made some of the 3D printed books have uh, like one has an early version of Photoshop inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, but, it, but it's, it's interesting because like, I just found a box from college and my dark room, like my photography uh, class and my contact sheets. And I found some treasures that if they had been on a drive, I would have never found. So I, I actually thought about that. Um, so someone is asking when the recording of the lecture will be available. Um, I think Rachel can answer that question, but it'll probably be a couple of days before it makes it onto our YouTube channel. So yeah, I was gonna say a couple of days. Okay. Thanks for everything, Rachel. No problem. Thank you. This was fun. Oh, and um, don't forget, everybody, I'm teaching at Peters Valley this summer. So you guys better, oh, you know, Kristen and Rachel and Jennifer, take your vitamins. I'm going to be there in June. <laughs> <Can't Well, wait. laughs> we're looking forward to it. Mike Porfido says, love you guys. Oh, love you too, Michael. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Cindy says, I agree. Programs are hard to learn. So many buttons for so many things. Thanks for sharing. Ann Williams says, fun watching. I remember that dark room. <laughs> <laughs> it was above your bedroom, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Amelia Panico is saying, so dangerous to weld. Oh, oh gosh, yes. Indeed it is, right? Yeah, it's yeah. hot stuff. Well, I think there are no more questions. Thank you both so very much um, for joining us and um, for sharing your creative process. Very, very inspiring and mind blowing. It's gonna give me something to think about tonight for sure. Um, and look forward to seeing you on campus. And thank you everyone for tuning in and Rachel for making this all happen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.